hard work, isn't it? Every time I go to one of these things and I have to, and I have to sit there and listen a whole day, I have a lot greater appreciation for the students in my classroom. <laughs> Do you remember high school? Anybody remember high school? Remember how tired you were at the end of the day? Oh, I, oh, I get to go home now. <laughs> Thinking is hard work. Henry Ford said, that's why so few people do it. <laughs> we had a student once at, at uh, Stonebridge, and she was in, in Gay for Don's class, and Gay for Don is just a real, probably one of the you know, most intellectual teachers we ever hired. And uh, one time she asked the student the question, and the uh, student just shook her head and said, Ms. Verdon, every time you call on me, you, you just make my brain hurt. Because <laughs> she's one of those teachers that she wouldn't let you if, you, if you asked her, you know, if you made a comment and you weren't right on, she'd have follow-up questions. She'd make, you, she'd make you think until she got you in the right spot. So uh, make your brain hurt. All right, um, the progressive period. I think that uh, in some ways we sh should call this the digressive period, not the progressive period. Um, we do have the idea that ideas of the progressives, you know, that we are, we are progressing. We are progressing through the evolutionary process. We'll find out that's what they believe. But this man right here, John Dewey, from 1859 to 1952, was other than Webster and Horace Mann, very, very, very influential man in education. Not just in America, but around the world. Um, he published over 300 books. Some say, I, some, I saw 300 someplace, I saw 700 somewhere else. He's considered the father of progressive education. He is a Fabian socialist. We'll see. What are Fabian socialists? Fabius was a general, if I understand, that believed in kind of the, the uh, incremental approach. So do gradually take uh, territory. So the Fabian socialists are their, they're kind of the kinder, gentler socialists, not, you know, think versus the communists and Russia and, you know, Lenin and Stalin and all that. The, the counterpart to that, still embracing those ideas socialist ideas, but they were the Fabian socialists. They were content to not have this aggressive uh, overthrow, violent revolution, you know. Um, they were content to, to let it move forward gradually. They knew they were gonna get there eventually. Um, one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto, founding member of the American ACLU, I forgot what it means now, American Civil, there you go, Civil Liberties. We have the ACLJ that's right by us in, in uh, Virginia Beach, the Christian organization. President of the League for Industrial Democracy. And uh, the League for Industrial Democracy is the American version of the British Fabian Society. And uh, of course, eventually ended up at Columbia University Teachers College and very, very influential in developing Teachers training, teacher training programs. Um, someone put together a bibliography. Again, see how prolific this man was in his thinking and writing. Someone put together a bibliography of his books and his articles and so forth. The bibliography was 150 pages long. So very influential. Um, you know, make, make sure when we say he's one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto, uh, here are several quotes, just so you know, what is it? What religion did the Humanist Manifesto advocate? Religion of Humanism. What is that? These are quotes from uh, both one and two. Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. We find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of the supernatural is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of survival. 
and fulfillment of the human race. As non-theists, we begin with humans, not God. Nature, not deity. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. Now, just to uh, focus in on that last statement for a bit, what does it mean to save yourself? How do you save yourself? What is it? What is that? A selfie. A selfie. <laughs> that will save yourself in a way, <laughs> at least while there's, until it gets lost in cyberspace, right? Uh, but the instrument will find out for the humanists and the socialists and others of this philosophy, the instrument for salvation will become the civil government. And the civil government will be um, perpetuated by its educational system, the state education. And what do they need to save us? What does the civil government need? It needs two things. It needs power and authority, right? And then it needs money. So in order to be saved, we'll have to continually give power and money to civil government. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a few quotes from Dewey just to get yourself into his mind. I've read quite a bit of Dewey, and to be honest, with, as with, if you've read any philosophers, you realize, first thing you realize, philosophers are hard to read, right? In general. But secondly, if they're not biblically based philosophers, they're even harder to read because their assumptions are not biblical. And so you're reading them and you're trying to understand them, but you've got a whole different set of assumptions if you are thinking in biblical terms. So I've read a good bit of Dewey, but I wouldn't claim to be any kind of Dewey expert. He's, he's, he's hard to understand in my, in my opinion. Even in writing about education, I, ha I have a hard time figuring out where he's going with a lot of things that he's saying. But there's, there's some pointed quotes that I think that, uh, that really show where he is in terms of his worldview. So the first one is this. Uh, there's no God and no soul. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Hence, there are no needs for the props of religion with dogma and creed excluded then immutable or unchangeable truth is also dead and buried. There's no room for fixed natural law or permanent moral absolutes. Okay? So this is, this is Dewey on God and truth. Dewey said this, I believe the only true education comes through the stimulation of the child's powers by the demands of the social situations in which he finds himself. Through these demands, he is stimulated to act as a member of a unity, to emerge from his original narrowness of action and feeling, and to conceive himself from the standpoint of the welfare of the group to which he belongs. End quote. Um, Dewey was big on the social aspect of the school and this whole group, um, which is... Um, kind of an opposite idea to the principle of individuality, especially when taken to the extreme that a lot of these socialists and utopians do. Why do socialists, collectivists emphasize the group so much rather than the individual? And we find that we find this idea in societies as well, in cultures. Well, number one is at, at its root. Um, there is the idea of the collective, but, but uh, taken to an extreme, it's, it's, it's an idea that's against the idea of individuality. So in, in that way, it's, it's a non-biblical idea. But from a practical standpoint, when you emphasize the group and the welfare of the group, um, it's easier to control a group. Totalitarian governments know that. It's easier to control a group than individuals that think and reason and act according to individual ideas. Yes.
Yeah, good point. Okay. the money to do it and that's why I was talking to somebody earlier about the common core you know again you know follow follow the money the, the reason why this and this this is one thing in a long su succession of educational reforms right you know we had the school to work and we had the goals 2000 and the no child left behind and I mean you could, you could go on and on um, but Behind this, you have tremendous amounts of money. So you, you want somebody to do something, and you've got the money and the legislative ability. You've got the power, the authority. It's hard, it's hard to stop it. So um, group think. Cho this is, uh, again, this is, this is Dewey. Children who know how to think for themselves. Oh, wow. Spoil the harmony of the collective society which is coming where everyone is interdependent. End quote. So, you don't want children to think for themselves? What kind of curriculum and methods would you develop if you wanted to make sure that children weren't thinking for themselves and spoiling this whole harmony of the collective? Moral training. I believe that moral education centers about this conception of the school as a mode of social life, that the best and deepest moral training is precisely that which one gets through having to enter into proper relations with others in a unity of work and thought. The present educational systems, so far as they destroy or neglect this unity, render it difficult or impossible to get any genuine, regular moral training. Now when Dewey and Others spoke of moral training. It was always outside of God and the Bible. Okay? These were never considered as sources. Government. I believe the child should be stimulated and controlled in his work through the life of the community. From what we know about the proper definition of government, you see the word stimulated and controlled. Is that external government or is that internal government? Is that government from the inside out or from the outside in? Those words suggest being stimulated, being controlled from the outside in. It's not self government. Government is no longer self, internal Christian self government. The child is even going to be controlled from the outside. The social is absolutized, if I can use that word. I believe that every teacher should realize the dignity of his calling, that he is a social servant set apart for the maintenance of proper social order and the securing of the right social growth. So the social aspect, again, you know, in this, we know the biblical, you know, we love God and we love our neighbor. So with man and now with Dewey, you have the vertical relationship removed, and now it's just love of your neighbor the social aspect. And this quote from Dewey, I believe that this is the way the teacher always is the prophet of the true God and the usher in of the true kingdom of God. 
So does, does education relu lose its religious uh, aspect? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's just transferred. Yes? It's very flattering. Flattering the teacher. They're flattering the individual. It's flattering. Mm -hmm. You hear that today. If you listen carefully to people talk about education today, especially if you listen to a lot of political speeches. I went back and just recently, because it was the 50th anniversary of the Great Society speech uh, by LBJ, I went back and, and read that. He had a lot to say about education. But, and it, it was this type of language that we're seeing right here. Messianic view of education, but without God in the Bible. But, yes, sir. Yeah, so it, it's, it's God in a different sense. Absolutely. But it's a religion nonetheless. Yes? I was just wondering where the, if you know where this quote came from because a few talks ago he said there is no God and in this one he's saying there is a God and it's the true kingdom of God and so oftentimes we don't have the full context of what they're saying. It's hard to understand what he's getting at. So I'm just curious, do you know what he was getting at when in one quote he said there is no God and the other quote he said the true God well, I think. Okay, go ahead, Grant. Just read Dewey's book called Psychology. It was actually educational psychology, and he was doing just what Thorndike was doing. It was basically an attempt to say that humanism would be a religion to transcend the previous religions that he and Thorndike were so disillusioned with. They really felt that man was animal and he was only reacting to his environment. I mean, it is environmentalism at its best. And that whatever man does is just a function of his environment. And so, you know, there's no real absolute truth. There's no real God. It's just a, we're just a ball of neurons. And we behave, and by the way, this, you're probably going to, this is where Skinner went as well. B.F. Skinner was then a disciple of Dewey. And, and so this is what we see in education, is so many of these brain-based seminars that say all you have to do is control the neurons of children, because that's all they are. And you know, sexuality and substance abuse and all this, just, it's all a function of environment and there's no real absolute truth in it all. Uh, but just read Psychology, that was Dewey's treatise on his religion that should transcend all previous theistic religions, and it was all environmentalism. Yes? Well, it sounds to me like these definitions are almost de defining cults and cultism. I mean, that's how these people that raise up cults behave, and I'm wondering <coughs> if there's a linkage there. Well, <laughs> there is, yeah. and it actually <laughs> Okay, good. Good comments, good, good questions. You know, th this is, w once you get into this, I mean, you, you can go on forever. I mean, Grant, you know, got a good point. You could take any one of these people, we're not talking about Rousseau that much. I mean, there's, there's a, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, all right, so we're going to, we're not going to talk about Rousseau, but we're going to talk about Hegel just, just briefly. <coughs> Again, uh, he was a German philosopher. Uh, he was an influencer of, of uh, Dewey, so that's why I wanted to mention him. Came up with the whole idea of the dialectic. And you, t um, I'll be honest with you, have you read a lot of Hegel? 
a little. Has anybody read a lot of Hegel? Hegel is very difficult to read as a philosopher, even even professional professionals who you know study philosophy and read philosophy say that that uh, Hegel is very hard to understand. Um, and I spent a long time at hearing the whole idea of the dialectic and and not understanding what it was. Um, so I'm going to try to simplify it, and and maybe this helps. But um, we'll see. Anyway, um, the the uh, the biblical idea prior to Hegel had been that there would be that that there's a a position and an opposite. I, I gave it gave it to you several ways: position, opposition, thesis, antithesis. Um, this is the basis of of debate, right? Anybody involved in debate? You know, you take one person, you know, you t person take a position, and someone else take the opposite position, and you have a debate. Um, truth versus falsehood. But with Hegel, you have basically the thesis and the antithesis resulting in a synthesis. So there's not this there's not this right and wrong anymore or black and white there's 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 gray there's not right and wrong there's something in between um, there's a consensus and this ultimately led to and I don't know I haven't not read enough of Hegel to know that this was his intent I don't think necessarily this was his intent but it eventually got applied to moral areas and it became moral relativism. There's not a right and wrong anymore, there's, there's something in, 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 the, in the middle. Um, so the uh, quote by David Breeze here said, uh, Dewey later testified that Hegel satisfied an intellectual craving. Dewey derived from Hegel a sense of the ideal and also the view that reality was not fixed, hard, foundational, never to be changed thing. Dewey came to see that reality is change, emergence, and development, rather than as a static and fixed thing that is foundational and unalterable. Um, so Dewey, as well as others, took up this idea of the dialectic, and, and he applied it to education, whereas Marx applied it and became part of his worldview, and it became what we call dialectical materialism. And the whole idea that progress, when you throw out the Christian idea of progress, then, well, how, do, how does society improve or get better? Well, you combine the idea of the dialectic with evolution, and you've got this powerful idea that, that, that moves society ahead. Um, and it comes about by clash or conflict. Of course, uh, communists picked up on that and said, well, we can make this thing progress faster by bringing about more conflict. But anyway, um, so the progressives, kind of by summary, they were atheists. So as Grant said, rather than study God, they decided we should study man. Clinical psychology was born. The stimulus response method of learning came about. Again, you know, we don't want children to think so much. That might disturb the consensus of the group. Okay, so now you have stimulus response. Now you have testing. It goes from essay and composition to think true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank. The pur purpose of education now is to have a socializing effect on the child. And they all believe that free enterprise is the cause of evil in man. That just came as part of the package. This man, Charles Francis Potter, wrote, Humanism, a new religion. And you, you may have heard this quote before. But this was, this was in 1930. Think about this. This was almost 100 years ago. Potter says that education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism. And every American school is a school of humanism. What can a theistic Sunday school's meeting for an hour or once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of the five-day program of humanistic teaching? Wow. <laughs> and I have to say, I think he's absolutely right about that. 
So if 1930s, if, if he's correct, if in 1930s all American schools were schools of humanism, where are we now? And by the way, I've been in, this is a little disclaimer, I've been in Christian education all my life, 35 years, and I talk to a lot of audiences that have public school teachers in there. And, when, and sometimes when you start talking about Christian education, public school teachers feel attacked in some way. But uh, I want it known that I fully support public school teachers. I think, they're, I think they're missionaries. I think they're going into a culture that's very, a very difficult place, and I support them. I pray for them. I bless them. I don't want to send my children there. That's different. <laughs> but I have no problem with an adult that goes there and tries to make a difference. You know, so many people that I know are Christians and they've gone in public schools because of this very thing that we're talking about. They're trying to make a difference. They see this problem. They want to be part of the solution. And I bless them for that. I think that's wonderful. Um, but for my four children, I knew that that was not the place for them because they had to be given a distinctively Christian education. We've got 30 minutes here and we'll see. I, I've got this little part, we'll see if I can get through some or most of this. But uh, something I normally wouldn't put in a presentation on American education, but I recently read a book, um, When a Nation Forgets God, Seven Lessons We Must Learn from Nazi Germany by Erwin Lutzer. And um, I just was struck when I read this book uh, of the, of, of, uh, education, how education had been s such a tool in the hands of Hitler and, uh, and his goals in Nazi Germany. And I frankly saw tremendous parallels between, <laughs> between that and America. So um, I, thought, I thought this would be uh, something important for us to s spend a few minutes to take a look at. Uh, I'm not saying, and, and Lutzer said, said this in in, in, his, in the book as well. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that I think America's Nazi Germany or like Nazi Germany or that our leaders are like Hitler. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But there's some obvious parallels here that I think can be uh, instructive for us. Um, and these are quotes from Mein Kampf. So this, this is, this is uh, quotes from Hitler. So first of all, Start with this one. The first task of propaganda is to win people for subsequent organization. The second task of propaganda is the disruption of the existing state of affairs and the permeation of this state of affairs with the new doctrine. While the second task of the organization must be the struggle for power, thus to achieve the final success of the doctrine. The most striking success of a revolution will always have been achieved when the new philosophy of life, as far as possible, has been taught to all men and, if necessary, forced upon them. So propaganda through education. Um, this was a new doctrine. Hitler had, had some, some, some very um, uh, difficult concepts and ideas to force upon a people, did he not? I mean, the idea of exterminating a group of, of citizens in your country, you know, and to get the people to, to buy into that and to believe that that's a good thing to do. So how was he going to achieve that? Teach the new doctrine and, if necessary, force it upon them. We'll see he had no problem with that. Uh, one way he did this was through the use of language. You, you, may, you may notice something here in this politically correct language that we have today. Um, they had a low calorie diet for certain people. And that was starving children. Cleansing the land, the final solution, and the best of modern therapy, those were Phrases used for killing the Jews. Children's specialty centers were where children died. Now, some of these terms I had, I had not heard before. But what do we have today? 
removing a product of conception, terminating a pregnancy, a woman's right to choose, alternative lifestyle, an affair, cocktails, values-free, fairness doctrine, equality, you hear that one a lot today, and social justice. What do these things mean? They mean something often very different from these nice-sounding words. So use of language. Richard Terrell said this, create a critical mass of people who cannot discern meaning and truth from nonsense, and you will have a society ready, for the fall, ready to fall for the first charismatic leader to come along. Albert Einstein was a Jew, right? He was exiled from Germany. Why? Because he was a Jew. Now, I was, I chose this picture carefully. I thought, I thought I should put it up on Facebook and say, create a caption. <laughs> it's quite a hair style he's got there, isn't it? So this is what Einstein said. Being a lover of freedom, when the Nazi revolution came, I looked to the universities to defend it. I know that they had always boasted of their devotion to the cause of truth, but no, the universities took refuge in silence. Then I looked to the great editors of the newspapers, whose flaming editorials in days gone by had proclaimed their love of freedom, but they, like the universities, were silenced in a few short weeks. I then addressed myself to the authors, to those who had passed themselves off as the intellectual guides of Germany, and among whom was frequently discussed the question of freedom and its place in modern life. They, in turn, were very dumb. Only the church stood squarely across the path of Hitler's campaign for suppressing the truth. I had never had special interest in the church before, but now I could feel a great affection and admiration for it because the church alone has had the courage and persistence to stand for intellectual truth and moral freedom. I am forced to confess that what I once despise, I now praise unreservedly. N end quote. So, if you know anything about the story of Nazi Germany and the opposition of the church, there was a lot of the church that did what? They, they caved, right? But then there was a, a group of churches that opposed Hitler and his plans. And they were led by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And that is a wonderful story, um, if you've never read it, um, to see. Again, we've, we've talked a lot about men who've done, had some bad ideas and done some bad things, and then you come across somebody like a Dietrich Bonhoeffer that stood up against this powerful, powerful force of evil. And he, you know, if you know the end of the story, he gave his life. He was hanged like two or three weeks before the, uh, the, end, of the, the end of Hitler <laughs> and the war. But uh, everyone caved, you know. It came down to the church. So I think that's one of the parallels I see. What is, what is the responsibility today? We have a lot of people have caved, but what about us? that are in the church. What about us as Christians? Hitler said this about the youth. The youth of today is ever the people of tomorrow. For this reason, we have set before ourselves the task of inoculating our youth with the spirit of this community of the people at a very early age, at an age when human beings are still unperverted and therefore unspoiled. This Reich stands and it is building itself up for the future upon its youth. And this new Reich will give its youth to no one, but will, take, but will itself take youth and give to youth its own education and its own upbringing. Now, when this was objected to by some parents and some of the older generation, this is how Hitler responded. Your child belongs to us already. What are you? You will pass on. Your descendants, however, now stand in the new camp. In a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. He understood the power of education. In order to consolidate power, in order to 
uh, have these ideas accepted, especially this idea of this total solution. And you think about it, you know, those Jews weren't exterminated by one or two people. <laughs> they were thousands, they were, t you know, I, I did some research to find out how many people would have been involved in that whole process. I'm sure it's at least tens of thousands, but I don't know how many it was. How did Hitler, what I'm trying to show you here and, and I'm seeing for myself, how did Hitler get those people willing to do that? It was through the educational process. Here's Hitler again. German youth must no longer be confronted with the choice of whether they wish to grow up in a spirit of materialism or idealism, of racism, of internationalism, of religious or godlessness, but they must be consciously shaped according to principles which are recognized as correct according to the principles of the ideology of national socialism. So education in Nazi Germany, what did it look like? Children subjected to films showing that Jews were subhuman and a burden on society. Evolution extolled the virtues of the Aryan race, right? Survival of the fittest could be accelerated if we could just get rid of the weak. Textbooks rewritten to reflect the ideals of the Nazi agenda. Teachers' unions, 97% of the teachers belonging to the teachers' union that could, you know, put pressure on the teachers and write the curriculum and so forth. Some textbooks said that Jesus waged war against the Jews until they betrayed him and killed him. Again, trying to turn the people against the Jews. Professors were warned, quote, from now on it's not up to you to decide whether or not something is true but whether it is in, in the interest of the National Socialist Revolution. So, truth is no longer intrinsically truth. It's truth if it advances a cause. Group think was more important than what an individual thought. Youth were encouraged to encourage their parents to become good Nazis. Values clarification. Again, breaking down this idea of right and wrong. Values are uh, uh, right and wrong, values and so forth, morals are what you have decided they are. As long as you have, have uh, genuinely chosen and embraced these values, those are the ones that are right. Even in math class, here is a math question. If the construction of a lunatic asylum costs 6 million RM, whatever, German currency, how many houses at 15,000 RM each could have been built for that same amount? Okay? Idea that we shouldn't have lunatic asylum. Get rid of those, get rid of those people. We can better use that money to build houses. Lutzer said this, quote, group peer pressure was used to silence, if not change the mind of any student who still believed in the values of home and church. All curriculum was developed to ensure that students understood the Reich's worldview. There were new fields of study, racial studies, eugenics, defense studies, prehistory, etc. A new curriculum to get the ideas across so the agenda could go forth. Any of this sound familiar? Meanwhile, back in America, Harvard University professor of psychiatry, Dr. Chester Pierce, said this, every child in America who enters school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with ele allegiance toward elected officials, toward our founding fathers, toward our institutions, toward the preservation of this form of government. Patriotism, nationalism, and sovereignty, all that, prove, all that proves that children are sick because the truly well individual is one who has rejected all those things and is what I would call the true international child of the future. Well, I would say to Dr. Pierce, thanks for being honest. <laughs> thanks for being forthright. Now, some people have, would object, well, you know, you quote this you know, crazy guy here, and that's not fair because 
You know, I mean, he's a influencer in education, obviously, but, but how many people believe like he believes? Probably, you know, the class, teacher, teachers in the classroom, they don't, they don't believe stuff like this. You gotta realize these people are thought leaders, right? These people are the people that are developing the teacher education programs and the graduate programs and the PhD programs. These are people that are directly directing the curriculum writing. So these thoughts filter down. <laughs> they filter down to the teachers and to eventually to the students and to our families. Um, now the NEA is obviously a teacher's union. Blumenfeld has a lot to say in the book, NEA, Trojan Horse in American Education. But I'm going to give you just a couple of quotes from, these are sample resolutions from a convention, 2012-2013. And just think, you know, how does, how does this jive with, with what you as a parent or a teacher believes, your worldview and, and how you want your, your children taught? Plans, activities, and programs must increase respect, understanding, acceptance, and sensitivity toward individuals and groups in a diverse society composed of such groups as gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transgender persons. Such plans, activities, and programs must encourage all members of the educational community to examine assumptions and prejudices, including but not limited to racism, sexism, and homophobia. Diversity is probably the word. Um, we hear that used all the time, right? As a college counselor, visiting colleges all the time, and or they were coming to the school and explaining their programs and everything, and I and I and I heard the word diversity so many times. I finally started saying to them, "You, all I ever hear from university admissions people is how diverse you are." And yet, you are a university. Could you please explain to me in what way your school is unified? Or what, is, what do you have there that unifies? Or is there anything that unifies you? I, I, everybody's diverse. That's not unusual. You need to you know, pick a new word or something. I didn't tell them that part. But, but <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I'm thinking. You know, everybody's saying how diverse they are. But by, by being diverse, everybody's... It's, it's like, the, yeah, the same, exactly. It's like during the hippie days, everybody's trying to be different, and we all looked exactly alike. Uh, but anyway, um, two more from the National Education Association. NEA believes that every child should have direct and confidential access to comprehensive health, social, and psychological programs and services. Be careful of things like comprehensive and social and psychological, basically saying just about anything. The association also believes that schools should provide family planning, counseling, and access to birth control methods. And amazingly, amazingly, amazingly so, without, often without parental consent or even parental knowledge. It's just flabbergasting to me. Because I know, and I'm sure it's true in, in, in your schools and all the schools that I've been in, we, you, you, know, you can't give an aspirin out without the consent of the parent. And yet, these type of things can be given without the consent of parents or the knowledge of parents. The association deplores pre-publishing censorship, book-burning crusades, and attempts to ban books from school library, media centers, and school curricula. So, um, winding down here, I've got... 13 minutes. Uh, Carol mentioned this quote, philosophy of schoolroom in one generation will become the philosophy of government in the next. And uh, the person reported to have said that is Abraham Lincoln. I could, I've never been able to find that, found that documented anyway. But it's a good quote anyway, regardless of who said it. But uh, you've probably never seen that picture of Lincoln, right? I was a younger Lincoln. You've seen the one with the older one with the beard. And I'll digress just a minute and tell you a quick story about Lincoln. Um, one time, 
when he was running for political office or campaigning or something, um, a man came up to him and very, uh, very upset at him and, and accused him of being two-faced. And Lincoln looked at him and said, do you think if I had two faces, I'd be wearing this one? And he wasn't a really that attractive of a man. So the cause and effect relationship, this is a little chart just to show you the cause and effect relationship between education and government. Biblical Christian education will produce a Christian constitutional republic and pagan education. And that's not a derogatory term if you, when we say pagan education, it's really, a, according to Webster's definition, it, that's someone that doesn't know the true God. So pagan education is really thing, anything other than Christian education. It's not meant to be derogatory. We could use unbiblical education if we wanted to be a little bit uh, kinder. Um, but that will eventually produce socialism. Um, I'm going to just skip that slide because of time. And when we say education will eventually produce socialism, we have a lot of socialists involved in education, so certainly they will perpetuate their, their worldview. And here's a couple of points about that. Uh, and this, was a, this is an old statistic. I was not able to find a more recent one. So this statistic is 30 years old. I wonder, golly, what would the numbers would be like now? But at this time, um, in 82, there were documented 10,000 Marxist professors teaching at America's colleges and universities. Somebody once quipped that uh, after the uh, communism fell back in their late 80s, early 90s, that the only place you could find communists live and well was on the American colleges and university campuses. That's sad, but true comment. Percentage of Marxist faculty members can range from an estimated 90% in some Midwest universities. 90%. And um, it's a quote here. The strides made by Marxism at American universities in the last two decades are breathtaking. Every discipline has been affected by its preachment, and almost every faculty now counts among its members a resident Marxist scholar. So what is it that uh, makes Marxism an appealing worldview. Uh, I don't know whether you've studied Marxism from the standpoint of a worldview, but it is comprehensive. In other words, it answers all the basic questions of a worldview. It's not just a governmental system. That's, that's a, 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 an, an outgrowth or a part of communism. But uh, one thing that's appealing about it is that it teaches that religion is an illusion. It's it's an atheist or humanist based worldview. So for those that have that perspective, they, they could be inclined to gravitate toward Mar Marxism or socialism. Um, teaches that atheism is reality. That materialism, just as Grant said, you know, uh, are we all or all all of us are is stuff. We're just material. We're we're not. There isn't a spiritual and a, or there. There's not a spiritual or a soulish realm. It's just material. But, however, there's a good, there's a good, uh, good part to it, too. Man is progressing. There's, there's hope and a future for the Marxists and the socialists. This is what keeps them going. Um, it's the evolutionary process. That's man is becoming better. Man is being saved and will be saved. There is a utopia coming. So... You know, lest you think, why, you know, sometimes I'm tempted to think, why would anybody embrace this worldview? Why would anybody embrace this philosophy? Um, but that's why. So, um, again, in the interest of time, my answer, someone was telling me about 10, 10, 10 program. Or was it the 10, uh, 10 commandments, the 10 Bill of Rights and the Ten Planks of the Communist Manifesto. Well, I've got another ten, and it's my ten biblical reasons for Christian education. So, so I said that's kind of an answer to the uh, Planks of the Communist Manifesto. I don't have time to go in, into these now, but these are, this is basically the, uh, what's in my book. Little 
booklet on Christian education. Basically, it's an apologetic for Christian education. Um, and we just don't have time for those. So, uh, the scripture says that the foundations are destroyed. What can the righteous do? Carol Haz would say, teach. <laughs> teach your children. That's what you can do. There's obviously a lot of things that we can do. And, and education is not the only one. Um, but you may recognize this man as Samuel Adams. And all those guys were fathers of something, right? He was the father of the revolution. And um, which one of the things that struck me as I was doing this study was all these were men. You notice that I was, I've been talking about. And then when we get to the restoration part, we got God used two ladies, <laughs> Verna Hall and Rosalie Slater, to bring about the restoration of biblical Christian education. And I'm not saying I'm not making any comments about men and women based upon that. It's just I just thought that just struck me. These were, these were all men, and all of a sudden God used two, two ladies that were unmarried and didn't have children. That's the other thing. It's very unusual. But obviously they weren't doing this out of their own experience as mothers and as parents as teachers, but they were looking at the scriptures, scriptural principles, and they were looking at primary sources. So uh, uh, Adams, uh, um, Samuel Adams said this, let divines and philosophers, statesmen and patriots unite the endeavors to renovate the age, impressing the minds of men with the importance of educating their little boys and girls, of inculcating in the minds of youth the fear and love of the deity, and universal philanthropy, and in subordination to these great principles, the love of their country, of instructing in them in the art of self-government, without which they can never act as a wise part of the government of societies, great or small, in short, of leading them in the study and practice of the exalted virtues of the Christian system. End quote. So, uh, there's a couple things that I like in this. First of all, it says, we need to be impressing men with the importance of educating their little boys and girls because we all know that, generally speaking, the mothers are the ones that take responsibility for education in the home. The fathers need to be involved, and the fathers need to be right there. They need to be um, uh, watching over and stewarding the education of their children. Um, and teaching, you know, there's a number of things that we're supposed to be doing here, but the, the most... Th the most important thing is instructing them in the art of self-government. And that is a lead-in to my presentation tomorrow. So, um, final question for discussion. What is your role in the rebuilding the foundations of biblical Christian education in your family, church, business, or volunteer association? I want to assume that everybody here is teaching little children. You might take this information into another area and I'm going to go back to that slide but I'll just finish and then we'll finish by letting you talk so teach your children and your grandchildren <laughs> there's my seven Deuteronomy 4 9 somebody asked me this the other day because they were a grandparent and they called the foundation they were concerned and I said oh you're a parent I said no I'm a grandparent I said well the Bible says that you teach your children and your children's children she says oh where's that I said, in Deuteronomy 4.9 says, teach your children and your children's children. So um, we'll go back and end with your comments and, and uh, maybe your response to this question. to Common Core. Would you conclude this with a statement about Common Core from your perspective? Well, um, I, ha I have not researched Common Core. There are probably some in this room that have researched it a lot more than, than I have. And I understand that in Utah, it's a big deal. Virginia hasn't hit, hasn't hit us much uh, at this point. Uh, my basic comment would be there's bad, worse, and even worse. And every time 
one of these things comes down, and I mentioned the, you know, the school to work and then the goals 2000 and then no child left behind. Um, what I see is more consolidation of power and, 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 and what I understand about this common core is all moving toward, you know, like man had the common school. There have been those advocating the common curriculum for a long time. One curriculum for everybody. And um, I just think that's incredibly, first of all, it's incredibly impractical and naive to think that that would work. But I think, also think it's incredibly dangerous. And I think that we will get, um, you know, it will be, it will be a very, very low standard. From what I've seen from it, I mean, one of the objections is how low the standards are. Um, I have not personally, you know, taken a look at it to that extent. But is it bad? Is it something that should be opposed? Absolutely. Yeah. is a little bit ahead of the other kids in his class, which I never, naively, I did not know as a parent that could be a challenge. And so I cannot tell you how many emails I've received from his teacher, whether it's an email format or spoken format or meeting with the principals, and the common theme over and over again, and you're going to gasp, but I really do have these in writing, is we just want to keep Jasper down with the rest of the class. We, and I think, oh, could you type that? But those low standards, and as we've been in these trainings, I've thought about how we're all unique individuals created by God. We're all different. So why try to make everybody the same? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's good. If anybody else wants to weigh in on the Common Core, I know I've talked to several people that are really up on that. I have been involved. I had a, an adult Sunday school class in my church that I've taught for two decades, and there are a bunch of activists. And uh, one of the things they always wanted to do was work to, you know, keep these bad things coming down the pike into the public schools, keep them out. So I've been involved in those in those efforts for, for decades. Um, and it's wearying because they just they just keep coming and they have power and they have money so it's it's hard to stop and i and i and i I, i'm not saying that we shouldn't try to stop it i'm not saying that we shouldn't work in that area you know but my calling is primary to private christian schools and i you know of course when you're in that you you put all your time and energy into that you know you don't have much left for anything else outside of that but I, I greatly appreciate those that are working in that, in that area because, I mean, that's where 90% of our children are. So um, we, you know, we want it to be the best possible environment for them. Uh, but it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. Yes. theories of instruction. You have behaviorism, then cognitivism, and constructivism is kind of the latest part, and that is one of the main instructional bases for Common Core, the the constructivist philosophy of instruction. And it is really something that does not work, and it is really based kind of on a humanist uh, view of understanding of truth and, and a, a very, very damaging. So a lot of the, the, the curriculum and the standards, the way that they are approaching the, the teaching of the different topics and everything is based on, on that philosophy. That is also something rather new, okay, but very, very bad. Okay. Well, because my, my time is up, right? I I do have um. I do have a few of my books here for sale. 
I don't have an ability to process in credit cards or anything, so if you've got cash, you may like one of the three, eight, and 20 are the prices of them, so. And I'll be here tomorrow, too, if you. Uh, website is uh, thebiblicalthinker.com. The biblical if you don't have money but you want to purchase the books, you can just go on there and thebiblicalthinker.com. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. That was wonderful.